Oh my goodness, this week's episode is so good. We have a guest who has earned over $10 million with his online course business, and he's got so much to share with us. I can't wait for you to hear it, so let's get to it. Welcome to the Course Creators HQ Podcast, helping you navigate the latest techniques for creating and marketing online courses. And now, here is your host, Julie Hood. I have been dying to share this episode with you. It is so good and I can't wait for you to hear all of the insights that Ollie Richards shared with us. Make sure you listen to the last 10 minutes. That was some of my favorite parts. He talks about how long it takes to build an audience and where he would recommend that you get started when you're building and there were just so many questions that I had for him. So this is a long episode just to let you know, but be sure to check the show notes, coursecreatorshq.com slash 177 for the links that I mentioned so that you can hop on and get his information and enjoy. I hope you like it as much as I did. All right. Oh, I am so excited about our guest today. I've been on his email list for months now, and he's got so much good content and ideas to share with us. Ollie Richards is here, and he has built an incredible business called Story Learning and grown it tremendously. And now he's using his experience and his knowledge and everything that he's accomplished to teach other online entrepreneurs how to scale their businesses. So I can't wait to dig in. I've got so many questions for you, but welcome, Ali. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you joining us today. And how's everything in England today? Oh, well, thank you very much. Lovely intro. Um, and everything is very wet and damp and cold here. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, no. <laughs> That's what you get when you when you live here. Oh, gotcha. Well, I do love those rainy days where you can sit inside and get some work done. So that's always fun. Yep. Um, so one of the things I always like to mention this at the beginning so that people don't have to go to the end to catch it. But you have the a huge case study, which I was so impressed when I first saw this because I couldn't imagine doing it. It's a huge case study about growing story learning where you yeah. get into lots and lots of details and the listeners can get a hold of this, right? So we'll share it. Yeah, it's completely free. It's a 118 odd pages. Um, you can get down it for free when you join my newsletter at ollierichards.co. Um, yep. So go ahead and have a read. Um, hopefully you find it helpful. Yeah, I, I did. I dig in every now and then to certain pieces of it. So uh, it's really, it's great to hear all of the the ways that you grew the story learning business. So one of the things I have to ask, right, as we're getting going is when you were starting story learning. So everybody kind of knows what this is. It's a uh, learning foreign languages, correct? The yes. business and what makes it unique from uh, some of the other businesses that help with that? Sure. So we teach languages through stories and um, the, I can, I kind of expand on that in various different layers, depending on who I'm talking to, but, um, but, you know, to take it a step further, we teach languages through stories, not rules. Um, and the reason for that is that stories are how you learned your native language when your parents were reading you, you know, bedtime stories uh, when you were, you know, one, one year old. And it's the most natural way that we have to learn anything, but especially language. Um, and so that's what, that's the, that's the USP. That's the, that's the secret source. It's the method. And that's kind of how we um, lead. How, it's how we do everything over there. And it's, it's, it's important to do that with a, in a, in a niche like language learning, because it's very competitive. You're up against people like Duolingo, like Bab, um, Rosetta, Rosetta Stone, these huge companies that everyone's heard of. Um, and so we, you have to be different. You have to, be, be very clear about how, about how you're different. And that's, that's how we do it. I, I love that. And it brings up something that comes up a lot for my course creators and that's they're thinking about jumping in 
and they go out and they find all of these huge sites or or not even huge sites but a lot of other people who are already doing what they want to do and so i'm curious before you started um what was your thoughts around oh wow there's all these companies already should i go into this market should i do this should i go into it what did you what were you thinking yeah well so i started in 2013 and at the time i already felt like i was too late um, and I, th- I think uh, everyone does, you know, you, you hear this a lot from people starting on YouTube, for example, today is, oh, I'm too late. It's too saturated. Um, it's never, it's never too late. And I think with, you know, this whole AI thing coming down the track, uh, it's, it's, even, it's, a, it's a better time than, than ever, because there's going to be a real hunger for authentic quality, human, human content. Um, but, you know, I didn't start it off as, a, as, a, as a business. I, I, when I began story learning, it was simply a, a WordPress blog, and I published a one blog post a week for two years. That was literally all I did, and I, I didn't know that it was possible to grow it into a business. But you know what it's like when you first get started; you really just can't. It just seems like a, an impossible, an impossible dream. So I, I didn't hold out. I mean, I I kind of um, went about it as if I like as if it were possible to grow it into something bigger uh, but i but you know i didn't yet see how that would how it would be possible how i could actually get there um and so i you know i i i think uh, you know in the in the language learning space you've always had these big companies but because i was starting off like just writing a blog i never really considered them to be my competitors as such because i think i understood early on that there's a big difference between a corporate entity like a Duolingo or a Rosetta Stone and a personal brand with someone, someone making their own content and teaching online because people gravitate to people and, and other individuals. And that's the magic of a personal brand. It's the advantage that a personal brand has over a Duolingo, say. And I, I think I understood that quite early on. So I was thinking more like, if the question is about competitors, I was thinking more about other people, other bloggers and influencers in the language space, really, as as the people that I was, you know, up against, as it were. But I also realized, because I think I learned from some from, from some good people back at the beginning, um, I also realized that there was far more to be gained through collaboration and and um working together than there was to 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 consider people competitors. And that definitely proved to be the case. Yeah. Oh, so much good things that you said there, but I loved how you recognize that the personal brand and the stories you wanted to tell in your blogs is what made it so unique. So when, how long then before you started selling, do you remember when you started selling? Yeah. So I started in like summer 2013 and one year later I made, I released my first course. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I'd done like, you know, the occasional affiliate offer before that, but, um, but it wasn't it wasn't much. And so you have about like a year, a year and, and a bit in, I I released my first, my very first course. Um and um yeah, it was it was I you know, I I remember that I, I'd been thinking for a while about making a course, but didn't know how to do it. You know, when you first start, you don't you don't know how to make a course and how to how to I, I thought I could make a course, but I didn't know how to sell it or anything like that. And I remember at the time um, there was a um, there was a course that was released by a guy called Jeff Walker, who I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And it was um, it wasn't his whole product launch formula, but it was like um, I think he called it Seed Launch, and it was it was like a quick quick and dirty training on how to release and sell your first product, even if you don't have a list. Uh, I had a list, so I, I had something going for me. Um, and it was basically a five week training where you'd record live webinars. You'd record it uh, like you'd schedule a, se- a sequence of five webinars, deliver it live over those webinars, and then package it up and sell it. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and and so I just followed step by step what he taught, and it worked great. I made a few few thousand dollars on the first uh, first ever product launch, um, and yeah, the rest was history. Ah, oh, congratulations! So glad you did that, and that um his his content is really good on on how to get going i think he's he's great at helping folks with that so that's awesome so the another thing that i really wanted to talk to you about is how your content workflow goes and kind of how you pull that together so that you're scaling and and what's that look like these days yeah so um you know when i first started it was all 
through my blog. And then the second thing I added was a podcast and then a YouTube channel. Um, and that's, it, it was the pretty standard flow that any, um, using today's terminology creator would, would, would do. I, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the word creator at all. I don't identify as one. Um, but, but, you know, I think everyone knows what that, what that means. And so, um, so, you know, I, it was, it was the Ollie show basically with my blog, my podcast, my YouTube channel. And then, um, I think, you know, after a few years, I started to realize that, that there was opportunity in expanding beyond myself. And so I started experimenting with other formats. N nothing. I, I did a few other things like, you know, I started a second YouTube channel, um, but it was all, it was all fairly minor. The, the, the issue is, that once you want to scale beyond yourself and a few helpers, you need resource, you need financial resources to actually be able to do it, because uh, because stuff gets expensive fast when you are um, creating content, and so um, so we then set about once we had this story learning brand really well established, which took a you know five plus years actually to really get it in the form that you see today. Um, we sort of set about experimenting with new content platform so we started a new podcast a new youtube channel um and the way that i set about doing this is always the same way so the the first thing that i do is i i say to myself i need to be the one who's responsible for going out and kickstarting this channel okay mm -hmm. so for example when um we started doing youtube i went out and I learned how to do YouTube. I took courses. I talked to friends. I, I did a real deep dive and I took responsibility for learning the medium myself. And then I spent the best part of the first year uh, like deep in the weeds. I was coming up with the ideas for the videos. I was recording them, I was scripting them, ed even editing, editing them myself at first. And, you know, grew the channel to a couple of hundred thousand subscribers just myself. And I, and then, when we got to the point where I really kind of figured out, okay, here's how to do YouTube. Then um, I systematized it. So I bought on a script writer who could do the heavy lifting up front of, you know, um, what words am I going to say? And then I bought on a producer who would then work with, with video editors to um, actually get the, the thing up and running. Uh, and so we systematized it so that my, I mean, you know, we, we have a, my main YouTube channel now, for example, has 400,000 subscribers. It's a decent size. It's not huge, but it's a decent size. My total time commitment for that channel is about an hour a month because wow. all I do is I get the scripts. I just read them off the teleprompter and then I'm done. I upload them and then that, that's it. So I'm able to run a, a YouTube channel of that size um, with virtually no, no time commitment myself. But the real key was that I took the responsibility to learn it myself. Very few business owners will do this. Creators will, because creators start, that's how they start off. But business owners will usually think, who can I get to start a YouTube channel for me? And this is a big mistake because you end up having just like a me too channel where the content's mediocre, um, you know, nothing special about it. And then you just drown in the, in the, in the, in the red ocean of mediocre content. Like the real value with content is when you are in the top 1%, because then you get so like the reward you get traffic wise is so disproportionate. You, know, you can get millions of people finding your stuff. It's a disproportionate reward, but you do have to take the responsibility to learn that stuff yourself. And then once you've got it down, then you systematize it. And then eventually you can hand it off so that people then run the channel themselves using your systems. And that's when you can step back. Ah, oh, that's so brilliant. Any idea at the beginning, how much time you had to spend on it to get it going that first year? It was a lot. I mean, I, I was really living and breathing it, um, okay. but I was running the business at the same time. Um, yeah, but yeah. You know, I, I think I, you know, I was spending good two days a week on yeah. like full solid days a week um, on, on YouTube. So I would, you know, on, on Monday, I'd, I'd do Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, my YouTube days. And I would, um, I'd start off by researching video ideas and well, what am I going to record this week? I'd, I'd go off and I'd do the research process, which is super important figure out what the video was going to be. Um, and then I would, I would spend the rest of the day then kind of filming it, um, you know, tying it all together. And then the next day would be editing it and then coming up with the, 
title thumbnail metadata all, all of that stuff uploading it and so you know all in all it was a good couple of days a week to do that um and I, I mean that and that's precisely why most business owners would kind of look at that time commitment and think oh, no no way i could possibly do that but the way i was looking at it was that you know youtube is it's such a huge opportunity and it's such a key strategic piece it, it was at the time such a key strategic piece for story learning in terms of growth and marketing that i i felt like it was a it was a sensible um justifiable use of my time and and focus um because yeah you know I, the rest of the business is very well managed um it doesn't need that much of me so i thought well, you know the single biggest thing i can do is grow this big new content platform this new this new channel get us a whole bunch of new leads that's going to bring us more sales it's going to enable us to grow um so i'm very, you know very much thinking thinking about it in those terms oh, so good so what did you see as the key to growing the channel were there was it seo or was it obviously no. you as the person and your content but in addition to that yeah so the key with youtube and um i have a whole training i actually recorded a two-hour training on um how to grow a youtube channel which i give away free on my list uh, if anyone is on my newsletter um there's like a referral thing where you can share the newsletter and you get this 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 master class um in return it, it's it's all free um I just think the thing about me is I just can't help teaching the stuff that I learn. It's like, it's just, it's in my, it's in my DNA. I'm, I'm sure you understand what, that, what that's like. Um, and so, so the, the absolute key mindset with YouTube is that you, you model what's already working. Mm -hmm. And so, and all the big YouTubers do this, whether they admit it or not. Step <laughs> one is like, what's going on? What are other channels doing that's working really well? how can I take that and model it for myself? And uh, because what you do then is by doing that, by doing it that way around, you put yourself, you align yourself with the algorithm. And when you align yourself with the algorithm, that's when you get lots of exposure and YouTube just does its thing. Any, anything other than that is to fight against the algorithm. And then you're just kind of playing lucky dip basically. Right, right. Oh, that's such good advice. I hope everybody caught that, wrote that one down about follow the algorithm. So would you say right now, 2023, the YouTube algorithm is on shorts and that's the way to go? Or what What would you no, recommend not, right now? Not, not necessarily? Not necessarily. I mean, I think it really depends on your type of content, right? So, you know, if you're running an educational channel, you require, you require depth of, um, of engagement you know you need a certain amount of intimacy because an education education is, involves learning it sounds obvious to say but it's very different from say a mr beast entertainment style channel right or someone doing pranks or or or, or whatever for someone to learn a language and and be be willing to want to invest and learn learn with us they have to understand at a fairly deep level that the way that we're teaching and the way that we're doing things is right for them um or not right and if you're just doing 60 second shorts, like the thing with shorts is, you know, you'll watch a short and you might love it, but you have no idea who the person making it was. You just flip to the next one and it's kind of gone. Um, what what we tend to do is we, we release fairly long videos, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes long. And people really know who we are by the end of that. And, um, and, and you know, we're, it gives us time inside the videos to drop lots of hooks around. Um, you know, learning with stories and why that's good. And by the way, if you want a free thing, go and sign up using the link in the description, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so, so, you know, we really optimize for, for, for long form content. Um, I, I have lots of friends and colleagues who do use shorts to good effect, but I'd say, I'd say on the whole, you know, cause I, I know so many people in the, in this, in the, in the YouTube space. And I say on the whole, it's split right down the middle. There are people, huge channels who have grown massively using shorts and swear by them. And then just as many people with huge channels who have spent two years doing shorts and seen nothing in return. So lesson from that is like, you don't have to do it. That's the lesson that I take. Uh, this is so good. Thank you. You're like <laughs> dropping all of these knowledge bombs for us. So I have to, two more questions before I forget them. First, what's the name of the channel so we can go subscribe to your channel? Oh, sure. You can just search for my name or, or story learning. 
um, and you'll find we have a couple of YouTube channels. And if you search my name, you'd also I have I have a business focused YouTube channel as well. So I have a potential um, branding uh, conflict coming up as as I grow my um, my business personal brand because people are going to be searching for for, for Ollie Richards and they're going to they're wanting to learn Spanish and instead they find a video of me talking about email lists and like, you know, what the hell's going on. Uh, but yeah, if you just search my name or story learning, you'll you'll find it there. Okay, so I will I'll put the links in the show notes too, so you guys can go and uh, follow and get connected because I I want to go back and and study how you're doing this. So that's that's fantastic. The other thing I want to ask you is, have you been putting your podcast on YouTube? I did for a while, and then I realized the error of my ways. And um, oh no, <laughs> yeah. So this was for context, this is three or four years ago. And so my own personal, personal podcast, I don't do it anymore. Um, which I, we, we can talk about if you like, um, what I used to do was I would take the audio from the podcast and I would put it on YouTube, um, with a, you know, an, an image and then people could listen to the podcast there. But I realized later what I was doing is essentially just dumping content. And a lot of people make the mistake of doing this, like got some content. Cool. Let's put it on YouTube. No, the way to grow on YouTube very specifically is to build content that is tailor-made for the audience that you're trying to grow. Now, the thing with, thing with the podcast is it's audio only. There's no visuals. So if you're uploading something onto YouTube and um, got no visuals, <laughs> then um, you know you, you're not you don't have a very good content platform match, right? Now, with that said. The modern version of a podcast, like a lot, a lot of people now, when you say podcast, they actually think of YouTube. Like they think of this kind of, you know, like two people sitting across the table, very highly produced, you know, um, uh, you know, diary of a CEO style, um, style YouTube video podcast, whatever you want to call it. Those, that's, that's a different story because at least with that, you are consistent with the format. So you've got visuals. You, you can actually watch the interview taking place. Um, the visuals make sense. And as long as that's all you're doing on the channel, then you will attract. An, so let's say you do like a two hour podcast, like, like Stephen Bartlett does, and it's highly produced video. People will tune in to watch that instead of Netflix, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, because it's more interesting than some, you know, trash, uh, <laughs> you know, space filler that, 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 Net, that Netflix puts out seemingly at the expense of absolutely anything else. And, um, and so it, but so everyone who finds that channel and enjoys the videos will, um, will then watch more of that content as long as that's the next thing that gets put out. Okay. So what you're doing there is you're building a very tailored curated audience of people who like long form video content. Almost it's like, like watching a weekly TV show kind of thing. Is that yeah. What, yeah. So the, what I would not do is mix that with any other uh, any other kind of any other kind of format, right? So I wouldn't mix that with, say, a vlog channel, or I wouldn't mix that with um, like opinion pieces or whatever. I think it's 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 you want to have a very specific type of content that's consistent for the same audience throughout, because then that's how you get people coming back. That's how you get returning viewers. It's how um, YouTube then knows who else to serve the content to, um, you know, so it's all about being very specific, serving really tight, specific, consistent content to people. So if you were going to do a different format and, and I'll explain why I'm asking this. <laughs> yeah, no, so podcasts, uh, YouTube just added some new podcasting features. And I thought, you know what? I haven't put any of my podcasts at all on YouTube. I'm going to put use this new podcast RSS feed feature that they have and upload it and just see what it does. And then I, as I was thinking about it, I was like, wait, I have all these interviews like we're doing that yeah. I could upload. But like you're saying, it's completely different content from the podcast content. So maybe it'd be better to have a different channel for the different. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 100%. And that's why you see, you know, take someone like Ali Abdel, for example, uh, you know, fantastic YouTuber. He's got his main his main channel, which is, um, you know, productivity tips, that kind of thing, right? 10, 15 minute videos on how to use uh, Notion or whatever it may be. Um, 
And then um, he might, he's got a separate channel, which is his deep dive. And that's a podcast where he interviews other people, long form, two hour video interviews. And he's got a separate channel then, which is uh, vlogs where someone will follow him around and say, here I am going to buy a house in Manchester or, or whatever it is. Why does he do that? Because it's a different type of content with diff- which, is, which suits a different type of audience. And, um, and that, yeah, that, that, that's why. That is brilliant. I have never heard anyone else say that. So I, I thank you for sharing that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's that, that that's pretty that's pretty sort of standard standard way of doing things in the YouTube world. Um, I probably spend too much time in the YouTube world for my own good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been looking for a few resources and I haven't dug in nearly as deeply as I'd like to. But just what I've seen, I haven't heard that. So thank you for giving oh, us welcome. that scoop. You're welcome. Oh my gosh, there's so many things I want to ask you about. But um, do you, for the the content workflow, um, is there any big challenges you'd recommend us to think about and know about, you know, ahead of time as we're trying to make that workflow better? Yeah, I think you've got to go into the in, into building new media properties with a very long term view. I mean, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was when I was newer on my journey, I would I would do things like start a YouTube channel and then stop it six months later when I didn't have traction or I wasn't getting, you know, uh, ROI as I saw it at the time. Um, I actually made um made a made a video and published a newsletter recently where I was talking about how ROI I prefer to to actually add another another letter on the end of the acronym which is ROI T, meaning ROI over a specific time period because the thing with youtube is that it takes two years to get a channel up and running so what happens is you have two years of very flat line growth followed by a massive hockey stick so if you look at roi you know meaning like a tangible return on the money you've invested at any point in the first two years it's it's meaningless because Mm. the return is coming later in over a longer time period so um so with any media property you've got to resist the temptation to try something new to get a quick win and rather invest in it with a three to five year time horizon. And that is not what most people want to hear, but that's also why you kind of have this big bell curve of people who just get lost in the, in the noise of content with a long tail of a few very, very highly successful people because they're the ones who stick at it and, and just, and don't stop and just devote themselves to making that really, really good over over a period of time um so so that's that's the thing that's the thing to remember and and that's also why with content in general it you've you've either got the resources that you bring to bear have to be either a lot of time or a lot of money one or the other um the worst the worst of both the worst of all of all worlds is business owner who comes and says right i think we need a youtube channel for our business let's add on a youtube channel i'll give you a couple of thousand a month to do it it's like no not not going to happen. I'm not going to happen. You either need to get stuck in yourself, um, or you need to fully resource a team who can go out and do it. Bring in consultants to help guide. Um, uh, you know, speed up the the, the learning. You know, sp- increase the sort of speed to lesson learned, um, and um, and, and grow that way. If not, you're just going to get lost in a in a sea of mediocrity. Yeah, and I'm curious then how. How much quality do you think you need to have? And this has been one of the things that's held me back from YouTube in that I see channels and and creator channels, so not the entertainment, but the creator channels who have these very produced, lovely channels with lots of um, different angles and they have the nice slide-ins and it's just a pleasure to watch. And I think about what it would take to create that (laughs) and go, yeah, not, not going to happen. So do you think that's necessary? No, I think production, production quality is a red herring. Um, So my friend, Ari, uh, he's known as um, Xiaomai NYC. uh, He makes videos where he walks around, um, Chinatown in New York and surprises people by speaking different languages. He films the whole thing on this, on this, this kind of little vlogging camera, like super low resolution vlogging camera thing, like really low quality and, um, and gets millions of views per video. Um, Alex Wormosi, everyone knows him now for having like the most produced content on YouTube. Go back a couple of years. He was filming like with his iPhone in a box room. Um, nobody cared because the content was that good. So the lesson from that for me is 
forget production quality. If you can do it, great. But, you know, your iPhone and a light is more than enough. Not even a light <laughs> uh, in many <laughs> cases. Like I remember Hormozzi's early videos, it was just his webcam. It was awful, awful quality video. But the content was so special that that's why that's why it, it, um, it, got, it got traction. So if it's not production quality, then, then, then what is it? It's this creative spark. It's the USP. It's the thing that makes you very, very different. And, you know, the, the big challenge, you know, to take the business niche, for example, the entrepreneurship niche, the challenge for anyone in that space is that there's a lot of mediocre content. There's a lot of people kind of just pumping out content for the sake of content. And, um, you know, what you got to think is someone like, so when I watch YouTube is like in the evening, 6 p.m. when I'm cooking dinner for my family. Um, I'm on my own in the kitchen. I'm slicing onions or whatever. And I put some YouTube on in the background. I don't want to be flicking through videos. I want to choose one thing and I want to watch something really cool for half an hour. Mm -hmm. How are you going to make me choose your thing over everything else on YouTube? Answer, it has to be, it has to be something that is something that I that I am hugely interested in, like my favorite thing, my passion, and it has to be uh, has to have has to have a very unique take on it. Um, so, um, so for example, take someone like Ben Shapiro, you know, very controversial figure, um, with um, enormous audience, someone who is um, someone who is into conservative politics and likes the sort of sensational um sort of shouty politics type stuff it's like it's him or fox news right that's that's kind of like that's that's sort of the what that's what's the on, audience <laughs> that's sort of what's on what's on the menu right and so if for that kind of person like he he, he dials it in and you know he he just ramps it up to 11 and, um, you know, if you want a kind of opinionated conservative take on what, what's, what's been happening today, like you gotta, you gotta tune into him or, 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 a, or a handful of other people, you know, like, you know, cause you're going to look up Tucker Carlson or, or whatever, everyone else gets lost, right? Mm. Because, 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 because they are so magnetic in the way that they go about doing their thing for their specific audience. And so the worst thing to do in that scenario is try to try to be another one of them. You've got to do something different. You mm -hmm. have to, you'd have to, you'd have to take, have a, a very different um, take or you'd have to have a very different style or a very different format. And you'd have to really work at making an art out of that so that the people who maybe, um, maybe you have people, you know, just to carry on on that example, maybe you have people that, that, that like, um, the message of a Ben Shapiro, but don't like the way it's delivered. They, they, they prefer it was a bit more, uh, you know, a bit less sensationalist perhaps. So if you can provide that, then you've got a whole tranche of people who can really, who can, who can, who can fall in love with your thing and tune into you because you're offering what they want. So it's about, it's about really understanding where your uniqueness lies and, and, and then providing that to the highest possible quality. Uh, and, and that's, that's how you got to think about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that because you're getting to how you're different. And that's one thing we talk about a lot is, yeah, there's 50 people, hundred people doing your topic, but how are you going to be different? How, what are your stories going to yep. be? How are you going to pull that together? That's so good. Yeah. And it's hard. So, it's really hard, you know, and, uh, and that's, again, that's why most people don't do it. Cause it's really, really damn hard to do this well and, uh, and do it consistently. And I like you said consistently, because usually we have that initial momentum, we're all excited about it, and we can get going. But, and you had said this earlier about it's three years. So can you go three years with only a few downloads, and it hasn't hasn't kicked off? Like, how long will you go without getting that feedback? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not just to be clear, it's not that you get no that you would expect to get no views after after, after, you know, for, for like two or three years. You, you would expect to see some traction, but you know, it, it may be growth comes very quickly when it comes on, 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 on a platform like YouTube. So, um, you know, you have to be able, you have to be able to stick it out even when it seems like nothing's happening. 
Gotcha. Okay. So um, I have a lot of listeners who are kind of at the beginning, you know, they're yeah. just getting started thinking about a course, trying to get going. Do you have a, a couple pieces of advice that you would give them for that stage? Hmm. I, I think one of the most difficult stages to be at is when you have a course and no audience mm-hmm. because marketing is the, by far the hardest piece of this. You know, if, if you're, if, if you're teaching something that you're an expert at, then I, I'm not worried about the quality of your stuff. Like you're going to, even if it's just you and an iPhone in a dimly lit room, the quality of what you teach is going to be good. It's the marketing you're going to struggle with because most people are not natural marketers and there's a lot to learn. You know, to, to market effectively, so many skills have to have to come into play. Um, you know, you've got copywriting, you've got um, you've got page building, you've got offer creation, you've got um, you've got uh, you've got you've got you've got sales, um, you've got uh, you've got audience building, you've got uh, you know, take your pick. There's so many different skills that have to come together in order to effectively market and sell. And so, for people who go get the product first route it's then incredibly difficult because they've got to go off and learn marketing from scratch and that's a very difficult lonely game because if you do if you take the performance marketing route so performance marketing being you know i want to spend one dollar and i want to i want to spend fifty dollars to make a hundred dollar sale um so after tax i can I can maybe end up with a sort of 35, 40% profit margin and scale my business. Like So performance marketing is the most, it's hardest of all because of all the skills that have to come together. And most people realistically are just not going to be able to do that because it's, it's too hard. Um, so I think for most people, if the question is how, how do you help the most people become as successful as possible? I think the, 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 the answer is actually to start with audience building. Because mm-hmm. it's much more natural for people to do. Like, let's say you're teaching, um, let's say you're teaching uh, parents to get their kids to to sleep at night. You know, you can make YouTube videos about that, or write blogs about that, or start an Instagram account about that. It's natural for you to teach. You build an audience via your teaching, and then by the time you've got ten thousand people following you, you're then going to be able to make sales of your product. Like, it's super easy. And, and so you, you then, um, you, your, your experience of, of business and selling is just that much more, it's just that much more natural. And the reason that that's, that's so much easier is because if you have an audience of people who know, like, and trust you, then they're going to want to buy from you from a whole, for a whole host of reasons, you know, partly because, um, they, 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 they trust you and they believe that you have the answer for them. Um, partly because they've been learning from your content and, um, and, and so they know that, that you've, you've already helped them with their thing, but also frankly, just because they want to give back and they, and they, they like you, they want to support you in what you're doing. That's a big part of, you know, an audience who buys from people. So for all those reasons, I, 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 I think that, that I would really encourage people to think about the audience building side of things. Um, the other component to this is that because it's a slower path to go down the audience building route, what it does mean is that it, you're playing for time and with that time you can go off and learn all the other skills that you have to learn right so things like copywriting things like sales things like um email um email marketing all of these things you can learn over the years at a much more relaxed pace when you are kind of playing for time you know when you when you're just going a little bit slower um that's what that's what i did you know i didn't know what on earth I was doing for, for years, but because I'd built an audience, I was able to sell lots of products to the people who were following me in, in spite of having no marketing ability, um, just because I had this, you know, this, 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 this league of people who trusted what I, what I do. Um, so I would, you know, rate very highly the, the chances of someone who, who builds a quality audience of succeeding but I would rate very, very low the chances of someone who has a product and no audience of being able to build a successful business off the back of that. So this is kind of a trick question built uh, off that sure. <laughs> for building an audience. Is there a, a time frame that that if you're doing it well, that you can kind of plan on? Or is that just a random question? <laughs> you know, it can happen very quickly. Uh, it can happen very slowly as well. It, a lot of it depends on the quality. If you do it well, it can happen quickly. Um, 
if you do it in a very half-assed way, it can happen slowly or maybe never at all. So it is like anything. Um, I, I think, you know, as a rule of thumb, I think it's good to expect it building a really substantial, meaningful audience that will allow you to quit your job and work full time doing this new thing. I mean, I think two to three years is a is a sort of reasonable time frame to, to talk about. It can happen in a year if you really go hell for leather at building building your audience and give it give it your all. It can. It can happen very quickly. Um, but more often than not, you know, this is it's a, it's a it's a longer term thing. Um, so, so you know, it's it is a kind of length of a piece of string um, argument. But like anything else, the more the more time and attention that you put into it, uh, you know, the faster it can happen. And I'm so glad you said that because I think one of the challenges sometimes is we hear a lot of these gurus that are like, oh, you can do this tonight and have this out tomorrow and build this bazillion dollar business. And so I love the more practical, reasonable, how it really works for most people answers. So I appreciate that a ton. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, when- you're always going to find the exceptions, right? You're always going to find the people who 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 have you know built a, a seven figure business in a, in, in a year. And and it's certainly true that the more experienced you are, the you know the easier that is the easier that is to do. Um, but in general, you know, the way that marketers work is they look they will always reach for the case studies that support their case rather than presenting. And we all do this, you know. But but you know you don't if you've got you know ninety nine people who fail and one who succeeds. You're not going to talk about the 99 people that fail. You're going to bring on the person that succeeds, and um, and then you know put them up on a pedestal and say, you know, look, my stuff works, and 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 that's just the way things that's the way things are. And it's also in in many ways, it's also it's also accurate because you know I could I could sit here and give people a, an, ex, an exact blueprint for how to make a million dollars in the next two years. Um, one out of a th- out of ten thousand would succeed. Um, not because the blueprint's wrong, but because we're as human beings and human beings are, are inconsistent and they don't follow through and they let life get in the way for all understandable reasons. Um, so, you know, whether something works or how long something's take, something takes is highly subjective. Um, but that's that's kind of why at the end of the day, I'm I'm just a big fan of bringing your, bringing your absolute A game to everything you do and making it so that, you know, whether you're building an audience or building a product or you know, working on your, working on a particular marketing skill, you know, if you, if you aim to do that to a, you know, a sort of top 1% level and you don't just try and get a quick, quick win, but you actually set about learning to do that stuff properly. A a very small number of skills can come together and combine to make something huge. Um, You know, for example, if, if you get, if you really dedicate yourself to two things, copywriting and audience building and that's all you do you're going to make millions you, mm. you can't fail because you'll be because it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an absolute killer combination audience building for the traffic copywriting for the sales traffic sales traffic sales traffic conversion that's all that's all it is at the end of the day so if you just got good at those two things you you're you're, you're away um i think a lot of the time people just kind of get mediocre at 10 things and that's where there are no sparks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was reading your ebook, and you were talking about how you got started with the blog, and that you did intense blogging. Is that the platform that you would say people should be thinking about now, or would you recommend something else? And then I know we'll have to end soon, but I could go on for hours. <laughs> you know, I think, um, I, I think, I think any platform can work, and 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 the right platform is the one that you're going to be able to stick to. Um, because it's natural and enjoyable to you. So there's no point in you trying to do YouTube if you hate being on camera. Um, you know, right. unless unless you commit to saying, right, I'm going to, I'm determined to get good on camera. Fine, you know, you can do anything, right? But but generally speaking, um, you know, if you if you if you're a writer, then um, you know, a blog plus social media would be a good combination. If you enjoy in depth conversations and speaking, podcast is going to work. If you enjoy being on video and all that, then um, then um then uh then obviously youtube youtube is great i think these days because the algorithms are so powerful it makes sense to combine one long form evergreen platform with a form of social media that makes a lot of sense so my business brand for example um i'm doing my main format is is an email newsletter and um 
And then I pair that with Twitter. I do some LinkedIn as well. Um, and I find that um, Twitter is difficult, especially right now because the algorithm is all screwed up. Um, but essentially what that does is a, it, it allows me to reach new audiences on Twitter, but also it, it allows me to do it relatively easily because I can repurpose the text I've written for the email newsletter quite simply for Twitter because it's 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 the same medium, right? Um, and so to be able to to be able to save time in that way by putting all of your thought into the email newsletter and then making that social thing just that bit easier because the heavy lifting has already been done. That kind of just gives you a little bit of a, I think gives you a little bit of an advantage and helps you just speed things up a little bit. Um, but, but, you know, for me, it's because I enjoy writing. And so that's, that's what I choose to do. If I went all in on YouTube, it would probably be easier, but I don't really want to, because I already, already do YouTube for the language business. Oh, I am doing YouTube now for some <laughs> For the for the for the for the business news center as well, but but again, I'm in the fortunate position of being able to hire a very good team to be able to take care of that. So again, my time input is relatively low. Um, so yeah, a bit. So the answer is uh, choose text, audio, or video based on what you like the most and what you think you can stick to, and then stick to it and do it as well as you can. Aim to be you know, aim to be world class in that thing and stick at it for at least two years oh, Easy. such good <laughs> advice your twitter handle and i'll i'll link to it too um is it ollie yeah, twitter, richards I, I wish it was but there's a guy at google called ollie richards and he's basically got all of the domains all of the handles and everything so i and oh, i and no. he won't reply he won't reply to my emails so <laughs> that, that's just my luck so it's mr ollie richards on uh, on twitter Awesome. Oh my gosh. I wish we could continue, but I don't want to take up all of your day, but this was so incredible. So many knowledge bombs that you shared with us. And just, I love talking to people who have already gone through it and they share what the tough parts were and what worked. So thank yeah. you so much. This was it's so good. It's a pleasure. And thanks for asking such good questions too. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And everybody needs to get your ebook and get on your email list because his emails are so good. So I will put that link first, jump on there. And then um, looking forward, I hope you can come back again because I know I can yeah, talk, to you. <laughs> talk to you some more. So thanks so much, Ollie. Real pleasure. Thank you very much.